Part Second, Chapter Three of Nostromo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mario Pineda. Nostromo by Joseph Conrad. Part Second, The Isabels. Chapter Three. When General Barrios stopped to address Mrs. Good, Antonia raised negligently her hand, holding an open fan as if to shade from the sun her head, wrapped in a light lace shawl. The clear gleam of her blue eyes gliding behind the black fringe of eyelashes posed for a moment upon her father, then travelled footer to the figure of a young man of thirty at most, of medium height, rather thick-set, wearing a light overcoat. Bearing down with the open palm of his hand upon the knob of a flexible cane, he had been looking on from a distance. But directly he saw himself noticed, he approached quietly and put his elbow over the door of the landau. The shirt collar, cut low in the neck, the big bow of his cravat, the style of his clothing, from the round hat to the varnished shoes, suggested an idea of French elegance. But otherwise he was the very type of a fair Spanish creole. The fluffy moustache and the short, curly, golden beard did not conceal his lips, rosy, flesh, almost pouting in expression. His full, round face was of that warm, healthy creole white which is never tanned by its native sunshine. Martin de Coote was seldom exposed to the Costaguana sun under which he was born. His people had been long settled in Paris, where he had studied law, had dabbled in literature, had hoped now and then in moments of exaltation to become a poet like that other foreigner of Spanish blood, José María Heredia, in other moments he had, to pass the time, condescended to write articles on European affairs for the Seminario, the principal newspaper in Santa Marta, which printed them under the heading from our special correspondent, though the authorship was an open secret. Everybody in Costaguana, where the tale of compatriots from in Europe is jealously kept, knew that it was the son de Coup, a talented young man, supposed to be moving in the higher spheres of society. As a matter of fact, he was an idle boulevardier, in the touch with some small journalists, made free of a few newspaper offices, and welcome in the pleasured haunts of pressmen. This life, whose dreary superficiality is covered by the glitter of a universal blague, like the stupid clowning of a harlequin by the spangles of a motley costume, induced in him a French but most un-French cosmopolitanism, in reality a mere barren indifferentism posing as intellectual superiority. Of his own country he used to say to his French associates, Imagine an atmosphere of opera bouffe in which all the comic business of a stage statesmen, brigands, etc., etc., all their farcical stealing, intriguing, and stabbing is done in dead earnest. It is extremely funny. The fl blood flows all the time, and the actors believe themselves to be influencing the fate of the universe. Of course, government in general, any government anywhere, is a thing of exquisite comicality to a discerned mind. But really, we Spanish Americans do overstep the bounds. No man of ordinary intelligence can take part in the intrigues of Yun Fars Macabre. However, these Ribierists, of whom we heard so much just now, we are, are really trying in their own comical way to make the country habitable, and even to pay some of its debts. My friends, you had better write up, Senor Riviera, all you can in kindness to your own bondholders. Really, if what I am told in my letters is true, there is some chance for them at last. And he would explain, with rail in verve, what Don Vicente Riviera stood for, a mournful little man, oppressed by his own good intentions, the significance of battles won, whom Montero was, une grotesque benitu effreux, and the manner of the new lawn connected with railway development and the colonization of vast tracts of land in one great financial scheme. And his French friends would remark that evidently, this little fellow, the Cucunisant, la cuisine à fond, an important Parisian 
review asked them for an article on the situation. It was composed in a serious tone and a spirit of levity. Afterwards, he asked one of his intimates, Have you read my thing about the regeneration of Costaguana, you and Bond Black Hine? He imagined himself Parisian to the tips of his fingers, but far from being that he was in danger of remaining a sort of nondescript dilettante all his life. He had pushed the habit of universal raillery to a point where it blinded him to the genuine impulses of his own nature. To be suddenly selected from the executive member of the Patriotic Small Arms Committee of Sulaco seemed to him the height of the unexpected, one of those fantastic moves of which only his dear countrymen were capable. It's like a tile falling in my head. I, I, a executive member. It's the first I heard of it. What do I know of military rifles? Sefinambulesque, he had exclaimed to his favorite sister. For the Decoud family, except the old father and mother, used the friend language amongst themselves. And you should see the explanatory and confidential letter. Eight pages of it, no less. This letter, in Antonia's handwriting, was signed by Don José, who appealed to the young and gifted Costaguanero on public grounds and privately opened his heart to his talented godson, a man of wealth and leisure, with wide relations, and by his parentage and bringing up worthy of all confidence. Which means, Martin commented cynically to his sister, that I am not likely to misappropriate the funds or go blabbing to our charged affair here. The whole thing was being carried out behind the back of the war minister, Montero, a mistrusted member of the Riviera government, but difficult to get rid of at once. He was not to know anything of it till the troops under Barrios's command had the new rifle in their hands. The president dictator, whose position was very difficult, was alone in the secret. How funny, commented Martin's sister and confidante, to which the brother, with an air of best Parisian black, had retorted. It's immense. The idea of that chief of the stage engaged, with the help of private citizens, in digging a mine under his own indispensable war minister. No, we are unapproachable, and he laughed immoderately. Afterwards, his sister was surprised at the earnestness and ability he displayed in carrying out his mission, which circumstances made delicate, and his want of special knowledge rendered difficult. She had never seen Martin take so much trouble about anything in his whole life. It amuses me, he ex had explained briefly. I am beset by a lot of swindlers trying to sell all sorts of gas pine weapons. They are charming. They invite me to expensive luncheons. I keep up their hopes. It's extremely entertaining. Meanwhile, the real affair is being carried through in quite another quarter. When the business was concluded, he declared suddenly his intention of seeing the precious consignment delivered safely in Sulaco. The whole burlesque business, he thought, was worth following up to the end. He mumbled his excuses, tugging at his golden bird, before the acute young lady who, after the first wide stare of astonishment, looked at him with narrowed eyes and pronounced slowly, I believe you want to see Antonia. What Antonia? asked the Costawana Boulevardier in a vexed and disdainful tone. He shrugged his shoulders and spun round on his heel. His sister called out after him joyously. The Antonia you used to know when she wore her hair in two plates down her back. He had known her some eight years since, shortly before the Avellanos had left Europe for good. As a tall girl of sixteen, youthfully austere, and of a character already so formed that she ventured to treat slightingly his pose of this abused wisdom. On one occasion, as though she had lost all patience, she flew out at him about the aimlessness of his life and the levity of his opinions. He was twenty then, an only son, spoiled by his adoring family. This attack disconcerted him so greatly that he had faltered in his affectation of amused superiority before that insignificant cheat of a schoolgirl. But the impression left was so strong 
that ever since all the girl friends of his sisters recalled to him antonia avellanos by some faint resemblance or by the great force of contrast it was he told himself like a ridiculous fatality and of course in the news the decudes received regularly from costaguana the name of their friends the avellanos cropped up frequently the arrest and the abominable treatment of the ex-minister the dangers and hardships endured by the family its withdrawal in poverty to sulaco the death of the mother the monterey's pronunciamiento had taken place before martin de Coon reached costaguana he came out in a roundabout way through magellan's straits by the main line and the west coast service of the Ovisan company his precious consignment arrived just in time to convert the first feelings of consternation into a mood of hope and resolution publicly he was made much by the familias principales privately don jose still shaken and weak embraced him with tears in his eyes you have come out yourself no less could be expected from a decoud alas our worst fears have been realized he moaned affectionately and again he hugged his godson this was indeed the time for men of intellect and conscience to rally round in danger cause it was then that martin de Coo, the adopted child of western europe felt the absolute change of atmosphere he submitted to being embraced and talked to without a word he was moved in spite of himself by the the note of passion and sorrow known on the more refined stage of european politics but when the tall antonia advancing with her light step in the dimness of the big bare sala of the avellanos house offered him her hand in her emancipated way and murmured i am glad to see you here don martin he felt how impossible it would be to tell these two people that he had intended to go away by the next month's packet don jose meantime continued his praises every accession added to public confidence and besides what an example to the young man at home from the brilliant defender of the country's regeneration the worthy expounder of the party's political fate before the world everybody had read the magnificent article in the famous parisian review the world was now informed and the author's appearance at this moment was like a public act of faith june de Coon felt overcome by a feeling of impatient confusion his plan had been to return by way of the united states through california visit yellowstone park see chicago niagara have a look at canada perhaps made a short stay in new york a longer one in newport use his letters of introduction the pressure of antonia's hands was so frank the tone of her voice was so unexpectedly unchanged in its approving warmth that all he found to say after his low bow was i am inexpressibly grateful for your welcome but why need a man be thanked for returning to his native country i am sure doña antonia does not think so certainly not senor she said with a, that perfectly calm openness of matter which characterized all her utterances but when he returns as you return why may be glad for the sake of both Martin de Coote said nothing of his plans. He not only never breathed a word of them to any one, but only a fortnight later asked the mistress of the Casa Good, where he had of course obtained admission at once, leaning forward in his chair with an air of well-bred familiarity, whether she could not detect in him that day a marked change, an air, he explained, of more excellent gravity. At this, Mrs. Good turned her face full towards him with the silent inquiry of a slightly widened eyes and the merest ghost of a smile and habitual movement with her, which was very fascinating to men by something subtly devoted, finally self-forgetful, in its lively readiness of attention. Because they could, continued imperturbably, he felt no longer an idle cumberer of the earth. She was, he assured her, actually beholding at that moment the journalists of Sulaco. At once, Mr. Scoot glanced towards Antonia, posed upright in the corner of a high, straight-backed Spanish sofa, a large black fan waving slowly against the curves of her fine figure, 
the tips of uh, crossed feet peeping from under the hem of the black skirt. The good size also remained fixed there, while in an undertone he added that Miss Avellanos was quite aware of his new and unexpected vocation, which in Costaguana was generally the speciality of half-educated negroes and wholly penniless lawyers. Then, confronting with a sort of urbane effrontery, Mrs. Goods gazed, now turned sympathetically upon himself, he breathed out the words, Pro Patria. What had happened was that he had all at once yielded to Don Jose's pressing entreaties to take the direction of a newspaper that would voice the aspirations of the province. It had been Don Jose's old and cherished idea. The necessary plant, on a modest scale, and a large consignment of paper had been received from America some time before. The right man alone was wanted. Even Senor Moraga in Santa Marta had not been able to find one, and the matter was now becoming pressing. Some organ was absolutely needed to counteract the effect of the lies disseminated by the Monterey's press. The atrocious calumnies, the appeals to the people calling upon them to rise with their knives in their hands and put an end once for all to the Blancos, to these Gothic remnants, to these sinister mummies, these impotent paralyticos who plotted with foreigners for the surrender of the lands and the slavery of the people. The clamour of this negro liberalism frightened Senor Avellanos. A newspaper was the only remedy, and now that the right man had been found in Dicud, great black letters appeared painted between the windows above the arcaded ground floor of a house on the plaza. It was next to Ansani's great emporium of boots, silks, ironware, muslins, wooden toys, tiny silver arms, legs, heads, hearts, for exboto offerings, rosaries, champagne, women's hats, patent medicines, even a few dusty books in paper covers, and mostly in the French language. The big black letters formed the words, Offices of the Porvenir. From these offices a single folded sheet of Martin's journalism issued three times a week, and the sleek yellow and sunny, prowling in a suit of ample black and carpet slippers before the many doors of his establishment, greeted by a deep, sidelong inclination of his body, the journalist of Sulaco going to and from on the business of his august calling. End of Part 2nd Chapter 3second chapter four of nostromo this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by nick number nostromo by joseph conrad part second the isabels chapter four perhaps it was in the exercise of his calling that he had come to see the troops depart the porvenir of the day after next would no doubt relate the event, but its editor, leaning his side against the landau, seemed to look at nothing. The front rank of the company of infantry drawn up three deep across the shore end of the jetty when pressed too close would bring their bayonets to the charge ferociously, with an awful rattle, and then the crowd of spectators swayed back bodily, even under the noses of the big white mules. Notwithstanding the great multitude there was only a low muttering noise. The dust hung in a brown haze, in which the horsemen, wedged in the throng here and there, towered from the hips upwards, gazing all one way over the heads. Almost every one of them had mounted a friend, who steadied himself with both hands, grasping his shoulders from behind, and the rims of their hats touching made like one disc sustaining the cones of two pointed crowns with a double face underneath. A hoarse mozo would bawl out something to an acquaintance in the ranks, or a woman would shriek suddenly the word, Adios, followed by the Christian name of a man. General Barrios, in a shabby blue tunic and white peg-top trousers falling upon strange red boots, kept his head uncovered and stooped slightly, propping himself up with a thick stick. No, he had earned enough military glory to satiate any man, he insisted to Mrs. Gould, trying at the same time to put an air of gallantry into his attitude. A few jetty hairs hung sparsely from his upper lip. He had a salient nose, a thin, long jaw, and a black silk patch over one eye. 
His other eye, small and deep-set, twinkled erratically in all directions, aimlessly affable. The few European spectators, all men, who had naturally drifted into the neighborhood of the Gould carriage, betrayed by the solemnity of their faces their impression that the general must have had too much punch. Swedish punch, imported in bottles by Ansani, at the Amaria Club before he had started with his staff on a furious ride to the harbor. But Mrs. Gould bent forward, self-possessed, and declared her conviction that still more glory awaited the general in the near future. Senora, he remonstrated with great feeling, in the name of God, reflect! How can there be any glory for a man like me in overcoming that bald-headed embustero with the dyed mustaches? Pablo Ignacio Barrios, son of a village alcalde, general of division, commanding in chief the Occidental Military District, did not frequent the higher society of the town. He preferred the unceremonious gatherings of men where he could tell jaguar hunt stories, boast of his powers with the lasso, with which he could perform extremely difficult feats of the sort no married man should attempt, as the saying goes among the llaneros, relate tales of extraordinary night rides, encounters with wild bulls, struggles with crocodiles, adventures in the great forests, crossings of swollen rivers, and it was not mere boastfulness that prompted the general's reminiscences, but a genuine love of that wild life which he had led in his young days before he turned his back forever on the thatched roof of the parental tolderia in the woods. Wandering away as far as Mexico, he had fought against the French by the side, as he said, of Juarez, and was the only military man of Costa Juana who had ever encountered European troops in the field. That fact shed a great luster upon his name till it became eclipsed by the rising star of Montero. All his life he had been an inveterate gambler. He alluded himself quite openly to the current story how once, during some campaign, when in command of a brigade, he had gambled away his horses, pistols, and accoutrement to the very epaulettes, playing monte with his colonels the night before the battle. Finally he had sent under escort his sword, a presentation sword with a gold hilt, to the town in the rear of his position, to be immediately pledged for five hundred pesetas with a sleepy and frightened shopkeeper. By daybreak he had lost the last of that money, too, when his only remark, as he rose calmly, was, Now let us go and fight to the death. From that time he had become aware that a general could lead his troops into battle very well with a simple stick in his hand. It has been my custom ever since, he would say. He was always overwhelmed with debts. Even during the periods of splendor in his varied fortunes of a Costaguana general, when he held high military commands, his gold-laced uniforms were almost always in pawn with some tradesman. And at last, to avoid the incessant difficulties of costume caused by the anxious lenders, he had assumed a disdain of military trappings, an eccentric fashion of shabby old tunics which had become like a second nature. But the faction Barrios joined needed to fear no political betrayal. He was too much of a real soldier for the ignoble traffic of buying and selling victories. A member of the foreign diplomatic body in Santa Marta had once passed a judgment upon him. Barrios is a man of perfect honesty and even of some talent for war. Ma il manque de tenue. After the triumph of the Ribierists, he had obtained the reputedly lucrative Occidental command, mainly through the exertions of his creditors, the Santa Marta shopkeepers, all great politicians who moved heaven and earth in his interest publicly, and privately besieged Senor Moraga, the influential agent of the San Tome mine, with the exaggerated lamentations that if the general were passed over, we shall all be ruined. An incidental but favorable mention of his name in Mr. Gould Sr.'s long correspondence with his son had something to do with his appointment, too, but most of all, undoubtedly, his established political honesty. No one questioned the personal bravery of the tiger-killer, as the populace called him. He was, however, said to be unlucky in the field, but this was to be the beginning of an era of peace. The soldiers liked him for his humane temper, which was like a strange and precious flower unexpectedly blooming on the hotbed of corrupt revolutions, and when he rode slowly through the streets during some military display, the contemptuous good humor of his solitary eye roaming over the crowds extorted the acclamations of the populace. The women of that class especially seemed positively fascinated by the long drooping nose, the peaked chin, the heavy lower lip, the black silk eye-patch, and band slanting rakishly over the forehead. His high rank always procured an audience of caballeros for his sporting stories, which he detailed very well with a simple, grave enjoyment. As to the society of ladies, it was irksome by the restraints it imposed without any equivalent, as far as he could see. He had not, perhaps, spoken three times on the whole to Mrs. Gould since he had taken up his high command. 
but he had observed her frequently riding with the senor administrador and had pronounced that there was more sense in her little bridle hand than in all the female heads in sulaco his impulse had been to be very civil on parting to a woman who did not wobble in the saddle and happened to be the wife of a personality very important to a man always short of money he even pushed his attention so far as to desire the aide-de-camp at his side a thick-set short captain with a tartar physiognomy to bring along a corporal with a file of men in front of the carriage lest the crowd in its backward surges should incommode the mules of the senora then turning to the small knot of silent europeans looking on within earshot he raised his voice protectingly senores have no apprehension go on quietly making your ferrocarril your railways your telegraphs your there's enough wealth in Cosahuana to pay for everything, or else you would not be here. Ha <laughs> ha! Don't mind this little picardia of my friend Montero. In a little while you shall behold his dyed mustaches through the bars of a strong wooden cage. See, si, senores, fear nothing. Develop the country. Work! Work! The little group of engineers received this exhortation without a word, and after waving his hand at them loftily, he addressed himself again to Mrs. Gould. That is what Don Jose says we must do. Be enterprising. Work. Grow rich. To put Montero in a cage is my work, and when that insignificant piece of business is done, then, as Don Jose wishes us, we shall grow rich, one and all, like so many Englishmen, because it is money that saves a country, and— But a young officer in a very new uniform, hurrying up from the direction of the jetty, interrupted his interpretation of Senor Avellanos's ideals. The general made a movement of impatience. The other went on talking to him insistently, with an air of respect. The horses of the staff had been embarked, the steamer's gig was awaiting the general at the boat steps, and Barrios, after a fierce stare of his one eye, began to take leave. Don Jose roused himself for an appropriate phrase pronounced mechanically. The terrible strain of hope and fear was telling on him, and he seemed to husband the last sparks of his fire for those oratorical efforts of which even the distant Europe was to hear. Antonia, her red lips firmly closed, averted her head behind the raised fan, and young Decoud, though he felt the girl's eyes upon him, gazed away persistently, hooked on his elbow, with a scornful and complete detachment. Mrs. Gould heroically concealed her dismay at the appearance of men and events so remote from her racial conventions, dismay too deep to be uttered in words even to her husband. She understood his voiceless reserve better now. Their confidential intercourse fell not in moments of privacy, but precisely in public, when the quick meeting of their glances would comment upon some fresh turn of events. She had gone to his school of uncompromising silence, the only one possible, since so much that seemed shocking, weird, and grotesque in the working out of their purposes had to be accepted as normal in this country. Decidedly, the stately Antonia looked more mature and infinitely calm, but she would never have known how to reconcile the sudden sinkings of her heart with an amiable mobility of expression. Mrs. Gould smiled a good-bye at Barrios, nodded round to the Europeans, who raised their hats simultaneously, with an engaging invitation. "'I hope to see you all presently, at home,' then said nervously to Decoud, "'Get in, Don Martin,' and heard him mutter to himself in French as he opened the carriage door. Le jete. She heard him with a sort of exasperation. Nobody ought to have known better than himself that the first cast of dice had been already thrown long ago in a most desperate game. Distant acclamations, words of command yelled out, and a roll of drums on the jetty greeted the departing general. Something like a slight faintness came over her, and she looked blankly at Antonia's still face, wondering what would happen to Charlie if that absurd man failed. A la casa, Ignacio, she cried at the motionless broad back of the coachman, who gathered the reins without haste, mumbling to himself under his breath, Si, sí, la casa, si, sí, si, sí, niña. The carriage rolled noiselessly on the soft track, the shadows fell long on the dusty little plain interspersed with dark bushes, mounds of turned-up earth, low wooden buildings with iron roofs of the railway company, the sparse row of telegraph poles strode obliquely clear of the town, bearing a single, almost invisible wire far into the great campo, like a slender, vibrating feeler of that progress waiting outside for a moment of peace to enter and twine itself about the weary heart of the land. The café window of the Albergo di Italia Una was full of sunburnt whiskered faces of railway men, but at the other end of the house, the end of the Signori Inglesi, old Giorgio, at the door with one of his girls on each side, bared his bushy head as white as the snows of Higuerota. Mrs. Gould stopped the carriage. 
She seldom failed to speak to her protege. Moreover, the excitement, the heat, and the dust had made her thirsty. She asked for a glass of water. Giorgio sent the children indoors for it, and approached with pleasure expressed in his whole rugged countenance. It was not often that he had occasion to see his benefactress, who was also an Englishwoman, another title to his regard. He offered some excuses for his wife. It was a bad day with her, her oppressions. He tapped his own broad chest. She could not move from her chair that day. Decoud, ensconced in the corner of his seat, observed gloomily Mrs. Gould's old revolutionist. Then, offhand, "'Well, and what do you think of it all, Garibaldino?' Old Giorgio, looking at him with some curiosity, said civilly that the troops had marched very well. One-eyed Barrios and his officers had done wonders with the recruits in a short time. Those indios, only caught the other day, had gone swinging past in double-quick time, like Bersaligieri. They looked well-fed, too, and had whole uniforms. Uniforms, he repeated, with a half-smile of pity. A look of grim retrospect stole over his piercing, steady eyes. It had been otherwise in his time, when men fought against tyranny in the forests of Brazil or on the plains of Uruguay, starving on half-raw beef without salt, half-naked, with often only a knife tied to a stick for a weapon. And yet we used to prevail against the oppressor, he concluded, proudly. His animation fell. The slight gesture of his hand expressed discouragement, but he added that he had asked one of the sergeants to show him the new rifle. There was no such weapon in his fighting days, and if Barrios could not— "'Yes, yes,' broke in Don Jose, almost trembling with eagerness. "'We are safe. The good Senor Viola is a man of experience. Extremely deadly, is it not so? You have accomplished your mission admirably, my dear Martin.' Decoud, lolling back moodily, contemplated old Viola. "'Ah, yes, a man of experience. But who are you for, really, in your heart?' Mrs. Gould leaned over to the children. Linda had brought out a glass of water on a tray with extreme care. Giselle presented her with a bunch of flowers gathered hastily. "'For the people,' declared old Viola, sternly. "'We are all for the people, in the end.' "'Yes,' muttered old Viola savagely. "'And meantime they fight for you, blind, esclavos.' At that moment young Scarfe of the railway staff emerged from the door of the part reserved for the Signori Inglesi. He had come down to headquarters from somewhere up the line on a light engine, and had had just time to get a bath and change his clothes. He was a nice boy, and Mrs. Gould welcomed him. "'It's a delightful surprise to see you, Mrs. Gould. I've just come down. Usual luck. Missed everything, of course. This show is just over, and I hear there's been a great dance at Don Juste Lopez's last night. Is it true?' "'The young patricians,' Decoud began suddenly in his precise English, have indeed been dancing before they started off to the war with the great Pompey. Young Scarfe stared, astounded. You haven't met before, Mrs. Gould intervened. Mr. Decoud, Mr. Scarfe. Ah, but we are not going to Pharsalia, protested Don Jose with nervous haste, also in English. You should not jest like this, Martin. Antonia's breast rose and fell with a deeper breath. The young engineer was utterly in the dark. Great what? he muttered vaguely. Luckily, Montero is not a Caesar, Decoud continued. Not the two Monteros put together would make a decent parody of a Caesar. He crossed his arms on his breast, looking at Senor Avellanos, who had returned to his immobility. It is only you, Don Jose, who are a genuine old Roman. We are Romanus, eloquent and inflexible. Since he had heard the name of Montero pronounced, young Scarfe had been eager to express his simple feelings. In a loud and youthful tone, he hoped that this Montero was going to be licked once and for all and done with. There was no saying what would happen to the railway if the revolution got the upper hand. Perhaps it would have to be abandoned. It would not be the first railway gone to pot in Costajuana. You know, it's one of their so-called national things, he ran on, wrinkling up his nose as if the word had a suspicious flavor to his profound experience of South American affairs. And, of course, he chatted with animation, it had been such an immense piece of luck for him and his age to get appointed on the staff, of a big thing like that, don't you know? It would give him the pull over a lot of chaps all through life, he asserted. Therefore, down with Montero, Mrs. Gould. His artless grin disappeared slowly before the unanimous gravity of the faces turned upon him from the carriage. Only that old chap, Don Jose, presenting a motionless, waxy profile, stared straight on as if deaf. Scarfe did not know the Avellanos very well. 
They did not give balls, and Antonia never appeared at a ground-floor window, as some other young ladies used to do, attended by elder women, to chat with the caballeros on horseback in the calle. The stares of these creoles did not matter much, but what on earth had come to Mrs. Gould? She said, Go on, Ignacio, and gave him a slow inclination of the head. He heard a short laugh from that round-faced, Frenchified fellow. He colored up to the eyes and stared at Giorgio Viola, who had fallen back with the children, hat in hand. I shall want a horse presently, he said with some asperity to the old man. Si, sí, senor, there are plenty of horses, murmured the Garibaldino, smoothing absently with his brown hands the two heads, one dark with bronze glints, the other fair with a coppery ripple of the two girls by his side. The returning stream of sightseers raised a great dust on the road. Horsemen noticed the group. Go to your mother, he said. They are growing up as I am growing older, and there is nobody... He looked at the young engineer and stopped, as if awakened from a dream. Then, folding his arms on his breast, took up his usual position, leaning back in the doorway with an upward glance fastened on the white shoulder of Higuerota far away. In the carriage, Martin de Coud, shifting his position as though he could not make himself comfortable, muttered as he swayed towards Antonia, I suppose you hate me. Then, in a loud voice, he began to congratulate Don Jose upon all the engineers being convinced Ribierists. The interest of all those foreigners was gratifying. You have heard this one. He is an enlightened well-wisher. It is pleasant to think that the prosperity of Costa Juana is of some use to the world. He is very young, Mrs. Gould remarked quietly. And so very wise for his age, retorted Decoud. But here we have the naked truth from the mouth of that child. You are right, Don Jose. The natural treasures of Costa Juana are of importance to the progressive Europe represented by this youth, just as three hundred years ago the wealth of our Spanish fathers was a serious object to the rest of Europe, as represented by the bold buccaneers. There is a curse of futility upon our character. Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, chivalry and materialism, high-sounding sentiments and a supine morality, violent efforts for an idea and a sullen acquiescence in every form of corruption. We convulsed a continent for our independence only to become the passive prey of a democratic parody. The helpless victims of scoundrels and cutthroats, our institutions a mockery, our laws a farce. A Guzman Bento, our master. And we have sunk so low that when a man like you has awakened our conscience, a stupid barbarian of a Montero, great heavens, a Montero, becomes a deadly danger and an ignorant, boastful indio like Barrios is our defender. But Don Jose, disregarding the general indictment as though he had not heard a word of it, took up the defense of Barrios. The man was competent enough for his special task in the plan of campaign. It consisted in an offensive movement, with Caita as base, upon the flank of the revolutionist forces advancing from the south against Santa Marta, which was covered by another army with a president dictator in its midst. Don Jose became quite animated with a great flow of speech, bending forward anxiously under the steady eyes of his daughter. Decoud, as if silenced by so much ardor, did not make a sound. The bells of the city were striking the hour of oracion when the carriage rolled under the old gateway facing the harbor like a shapeless monument of leaves and stones. The rumble of wheels under the sonorous arch was traversed by a strange piercing shriek, and Decoud, from his back seat, had a view of the people behind the carriage trudging along the road outside, all turning their heads, in sombreros and rebosos, to look at a locomotive which rolled quickly out of sight behind Giorgio Viola's house, under a white trail of steam that seemed to vanish in the breathless, hysterically prolonged scream of warlike triumph and it was all like a fleeting vision, the shrieking ghost of a railway engine fleeing across the frame of the archway, behind the startled movement of the people streaming back from a military spectacle with silent footsteps on the dust of the road. It was a material train returning from the campo to the palisaded yards. The empty cars rolled lightly on the single track. There was no rumble of wheels, no tremor of the ground. The engine driver, running past the Casa Viola with the salute of an uplifted arm, checked his speed smartly before entering the yard, and when the ear-splitting screech of the steam whistle for the brakes had stopped, a series of hard, battering shocks mingled with the clanking of chain couplings made a tumult of blows and shaken fetters under the vault of the gate. End Part Second Chapter Four Recording by Nick Number Chapter 5 of Nostromo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Nostromo by Joseph Conrad, Part Second, The Isabels, Chapter Five, Part One. The Gould carriage was the first to return from the harbor to the empty town. On the ancient pavement, laid out in patterns, sunk into ruts and holes, the portly Ignacio, mindful of the springs of the Parisian-built Landau, had pulled up to a walk, and Decoux in his corner contemplated moodily the inner aspect of the gate. The squat, turreted sides held up between them a mass of masonry with bunches of grass growing at the top, and a grey, heavily scrolled armorial shield of stone above the apex of the arch, with the arms of Spain nearly smoothed out as if in readiness for some new device typical of the impending progress. The explosive noise of the railway truck seemed to augment Decoux's irritation. He muttered something to himself, then began to talk aloud in curt, angry phrases thrown at the silence of the two women. They did not look at him at all. While Don Jose, with his semi-translucent, waxy complexion, overshadowed by the soft gray hat, swayed a little to the jolts of the carriage by the side of Mrs. Gould. This sound puts a new edge on a very old truth. Decoux spoke in French, perhaps because of Ignacio on the box above him. The old coachman, with his broad back filling a short, silver-braided jacket, had a big pair of ears, whose thick rims stood well away from his cropped head. Yes, the noise outside the city wall is new, but the principle is old. He ruminated his discontent for a while, then began afresh with a sidelong glance at Antonia. No, but just imagine our forefathers in Morio and corselets drawn up outside this gate, and a band of adventurers just landed from their ships in the harbor there. Thieves, of course. Speculators, too. Their expeditions, each one, were the speculations of grave and reverend persons in England. That is history, as that absurd sailor Mitchell is always saying. Mitchell's arrangements for the embarkation of the troops was excellent, exclaimed Don Jose. That! That! Oh, that's really the work of that Genoese seaman. But to return to my noises, there used to be, in the old days, the sound of trumpets outside that gate. War trumpets! I'm sure they were trumpets. I have read somewhere that Drake, who was the greatest of these men, used to dine alone in his cabin on board ship to the sound of trumpets. In those days this town was full of wealth. Those men came to take it. Now the whole land is like a treasure house, and all these people are breaking into it, whilst we are cutting each other's throats. The only thing that keeps them out is mutual jealousy, but they'll come to an agreement some day, and by the time we've settled our quarrels and become decent and honorable, there'll be nothing left for us. It has always been the same. We are a wonderful people, but it has always been our fate to be... He did not say robbed, but added after a pause, exploited. Mrs. Gould said, Oh, this is unjust, and Antonia interjected. Don't answer him, Emilia. He is attacking me. You surely do not think I was attacking Don Carlos, Decoux answered. And then the carriage stopped before the door of the Casa Gould. The young man offered his hand to the ladies. They went in first together. Don Jose walked by the side of Decoux, and the gouty old porter tottered after them with some light wraps on his arm. Don Jose slipped his hand under the arm of the journalist of Sulaco. The poor veneer must have a long and confident article upon Barrios and the irresistibleness of his army of Cata. The moral effect should be kept up in the country. We must cable encouraging extracts to Europe and the United States to maintain a favorable impression abroad. Decoux muttered, Oh, yes, we must comfort our friends, the speculators. The long open gallery was in shadow, with its screen of plants and vases along the balustrade, holding out motionless blossoms, and all the glass doors of the reception rooms thrown open. A jingle of spurs died out at the further end. Basilio, standing against the wall, said in a soft tone to the passing ladies, The Senor Administrador is just back from the mountain. In the great sala, with its groups of ancient Spanish and modern European furniture making as if different centers under the high white spread of the ceiling, the silver and porcelain of the tea service gleamed among a cluster of dwarf chairs, like a bit of a lady's boudoir, putting in a note of feminine and intimate delicacy. Don Jose in his rocking chair placed his hat on his lap, and Decoux walked up and down the whole length of the room, passing between tables loaded with knick-knacks and almost disappearing behind the high backs of the leathern sofas. He was thinking of the angry face of Antonia. He was confident that he would make his peace with her. He had not stayed in Sulaco to quarrel with Antonia. Martin de Coux was angry with himself. All he saw and heard going on around him exasperated the preconceived views of his European civilization. To contemplate revolutions from the distance of the Parisian boulevards was quite another matter. Here on the spot it was not possible to dismiss their tragic comedy with the expression, Quel farce! The reality of the political action, such as it was, seemed closer, and acquired poignancy by Antonia's belief in the cause. Its crudeness hurt his feelings. He was surprised at his own sensitiveness. I suppose I am more of a Costaguanero than I would have believed possible, he thought to himself. His disdain grew like a reaction of his skepticism against the action into which he was forced by his infatuation for Antonia. He soothed himself by saying he was not a patriot, but a lover.
The ladies came in bareheaded, and Mrs. Gould sank low before the little tea-table. Antonio took up her usual place at the reception hour, the corner of a leathern couch, with a rigid grace in her pose and a fan in her hand. Decoux, swerving from the straight line of his march, came to lean over the high back of her seat. For a long time he talked into her ear from behind, softly, with a half-smile and an air of apologetic familiarity. Her fan lay half-grasped on her knees. She never looked at him. His rapid utterance grew more and more insistent and caressing. At last he ventured a slight laugh. No, really, you must forgive me. One must be serious sometimes. He paused. She turned her head a little. Her blue eyes glided slowly towards him, slightly upwards, mollified and questioning. You can't think I am serious when I call Montero a grand bestia every second day in the porvenir. That is not a serious occupation. No occupation is serious, not even when a bullet through the heart is the penalty of failure. Her hand closed firmly on her fan. Some reason, you understand I mean some sense, may creep into thinking. Some glimpse of truth. I mean some effective truth, for which there is no room in politics or journalism. I happen to have said what I thought, and you are angry. If you do me the kindness to think a little, you will see that I spoke like a patriot. She opened her red lips for the first time, not unkindly. Yes, but you never see the aim. Men must be used as they are. I suppose nobody is really disinterested, unless, perhaps, you, Don Martin. God forbid! It's the last thing I should like you to believe of me. He spoke lightly and paused. She began to fan herself with a slow movement without raising her hand. After a time he whispered passionately, Antonia! She smiled and extended her hand after the English manner towards Charles Gould, who was bowing before her, while Decoux, with his elbows spread on the back of the sofa, dropped his eyes and murmured, Bonjour! The Signor Administrador of the San Tome mine bent over his wife for a moment. They exchanged a few words, of which only the phrase, The greatest enthusiasm, pronounced by Mrs. Gould, could be heard. Yes, Decoux began in a murmur. Even he... This is sheer calumny, said Antonia, not very severely. You just ask him to throw his mind into the melting pot for the great cause, Decoux whispered. Don Jose had raised his voice. He rubbed his hands cheerily. The excellent aspect of the troops and the great quantity of new deadly rifles on the shoulders of those brave men seemed to fill him with an ecstatic confidence. Charles Gould, very tall and thin before his chair, listened, but nothing could be discovered in his face except a kind and deferential attention. Meanwhile, Antonia had risen, and, crossing the room, stood looking out of one of the three long windows giving on the street. Decoux followed her. The window was thrown open, and he leaned against the thickness of the wall. The long folds of the damask curtain, falling straight from the broad brass cornice, hid him partly from the room. He folded his arms on his breast, and looked steadily at Antonia's profile. The people returning from the harbour filled the pavements. The shuffle of sandals and a low murmur of voices ascended to the window. Now and then a coach rolled slowly along the disjointed roadway of the Cal de la Constitution. There were not many private carriages in Sulaco. At the most crowded hour on the Alameda they could be counted with one glance of the eye. The great family ark swayed on high leathern springs, full of pretty powdered faces in which the eyes looked intensely alive and black. At first Don Just Lopez, the president of the provincial assembly, passed with his three lovely daughters, solemn in black frock coat and stiff white tie, as when directing a debate from a high tribune. Though they all raised their eyes, Antonia did not make the usual greeting gesture of a fluttered hand, and they affected not to see the two young people, Costuganeros with European manners, whose eccentricities were discussed behind the barred windows of the first families of Sulaco. And then the widowed Senora Gavilazo de Valdez rolled by, handsome and dignified, in a great machine in which she used to travel to and from her country house, surrounded by an armed retinue in leather suits and big sombreros, with carbines at the bows of their saddles. She was a woman of most distinguished family, proud, rich, and kind-hearted. Her second son, Jamie, had just gone off to the staff of Barrios. The eldest, a worthless fellow of a moody disposition, filled Sulaco with the noise of his dissipations, and gambled heavily at the club. The two youngest boys, with yellow ribierist cockades in their caps, sat on the front seat. She, too, affected not to see the Señor Decoud talking publicly with Antonia in defiance of every convention, and he not even her novio as far as the world knew though even in that case it would have been scandal enough. But the dignified old lady, respected and admired by the first families, would have been still more shocked if she could have heard the words they were exchanging. Did you say I have lost sight of the aim? I have only one aim in the world. She made an almost imperceptible negative movement of her head, still staring across the street at the Avellanos' house, gray, marked with decay, and with iron bars like a prison. And it would be so easy of attainment, he continued, this aim which, whether knowingly or not, I have always had in my heart, 
ever since the day when you snubbed me so horribly once in Paris, you remember. A slight smile seemed to move the corner of the lip that was on his side. You know you were a very terrible person, a sort of Charlotte Corday in a schoolgirl's dress, a ferocious patriot. I suppose you would have stuck a knife into Guzman Bento. She interrupted him. You do me too much honor. At any rate, he said, changing suddenly to a tone of bitter levity, you would have sent me to stab him without compunction. Ah, uh, par exemple, she murmured in a shocked tone. Well, he argued mockingly, you do keep me here writing deadly nonsense, deadly to me. It has already killed my self-respect. And you may imagine, he continued, his tone passing into light banter, that Montero, should he be successful, would get even with me in the only way such a brute can get even with a man of intelligence who condescends to call him a grand bestia three times a week. It's a sort of intellectual death. But there is the other one in the background, for a journalist of my ability. If he is successful, said Antonia thoughtfully. You seem satisfied to see my life hang on a thread, Decoux replied with a broad smile. And the other Montero, the my trusted brother of the proclamations, the guerrillero. Haven't I written that he was taking the guests' overcoats and changing plates in Paris at our legation in the intervals of spying on our refugees there, in the time of Rojas? He will wash out that sacred truth in blood, in my blood. Why do you look annoyed? This is simply a bit of the biography of one of our great men. What do you think he will do to me? There is a certain convent wall round the corner of the plaza, opposite the door of the bull ring. You know, opposite the door with the inscription, Entrada de la Sombra? Appropriate, perhaps. That's where the uncle of our host gave up his Anglo-South American soul. And note, he might have run away. A man who has fought with weapons may run away. You might have let me go with Barrios if you had cared for me. I would have carried one of those rifles, in which Don José believes, with the greatest satisfaction, in the ranks of the poor peons and indios, that know nothing either of reason or politics. The most forlorn hope in the most forlorn army on earth would have been safer than that for which you have made me stay here. When you make war you may retreat, but not when you spend your time in inciting poor ignorant fools to kill and to die. His tone remained light, and as if unaware of his presence she stood motionless, her hands clasped lightly, the fan hanging down from her interlaced fingers. He waited for a while, and then, "'I shall go to the wall,' he said, with a sort of jocular desperation. Even that declaration did not make her look at him. Her head remained still, her eyes fixed upon the house of the Avalanos, whose chipped pilasters, broken cornices, the whole degradation of dignity was hidden now by the gathering dusk of the street. In her whole figure her lips moved alone, forming the words, "'Martin, you will make me cry.' He remained silent for a minute, startled, as if overwhelmed by a sort of odd happiness, with the lines of the mocking smile still stiffened about his mouth, and incredulous surprise in his eyes. The value of a sentence is in the personality which utters it, for nothing new can be said by man or woman. And those were the last words, it seemed to him, that could ever have been spoken by Antonia. He had never made it up with her so completely in all their intercourse of small encounters, but even before she had time to turn towards him, which she did slowly with a rigid grace, he had begun to plead. My sister is only waiting to embrace you. My father is transported with joy. I won't say anything of my mother. Our mothers were like sisters. There is the mail-boat for the south next week. Let us go. That Moraga is a fool. A man like Montero is bribed. It's the practice of the country. It's tradition. It's politics. Read fifty years of misrule. Leave poor papa alone, Don Martin. He believes— I have the greatest tenderness for your father, he began hurriedly. But I love you, Antonia and Moraga has miserably mismanaged this business. Perhaps your father did, too. I don't know. Montero was bribable. Why, I suppose he only wanted his share of this famous loan for national development. Why didn't the stupid Stamarta people give him a mission to Europe or something? He would have taken five years' salary in advance and gone on loafing in Paris, this stupid, ferocious Indio. The man, she said, thoughtfully, and very calm before this outburst, was intoxicated with vanity. We had all the information, not from Moraga only, from others, too. There was his brother intriguing, too. Oh, yes, he said. Of course you know. You know everything. You read all the correspondence. You write all the papers. All those state papers that are inspired here, in this room, in blind deference to a theory of political purity. Hadn't you Charles Gould before your eyes? Re de Sulaco. He and his mind are the practical demonstration of what could have been done. Do you think he succeeded by his fidelity to a theory of virtue? And all those railway people, with their honest work. Of course their work is honest. But what if you cannot work honestly till the thieves are satisfied? Could he not, a gentleman, have told his Sir John What's-His-Name that Montero had to be bought off? He and all his Negro liberals hanging on to his gold-laced sleeve? 
He ought to have been bought off with his own stupid weight of gold. His weight of gold, I tell you. Boots, saber, spurs, cocked hat, and all. She shook her head slightly. It was impossible, she murmured. He wanted the whole lot? What? She was facing him now in the deep recess of the window, very close and motionless. Her lips moved rapidly. Decoud, leaning his back against the wall, listened with crossed arms and lowered eyelids. He drank the tones of her even voice, and watched the agitated life of her throat, as if waves of emotion had run from her heart to pass out into the air in her reasonable words. He also had his aspirations. He aspired to carry her away out of these deadly futilities of pronunciamentos and reforms. All this was wrong, utterly wrong. But she fascinated him, and sometimes the sheer sagacity of a phrase would break the charm, replace the fascination by a sudden unwilling thrill of interest. Some women hovered, as it were, on the threshold of genius, he reflected. They did not want to know, or think, or understand. Passion stood for all that, and he was ready to believe that some startlingly profound remark, some appreciation of character, or a judgment upon an event, bordered on the miraculous. In the mature Antonia he could see with an extraordinary vividness the austere schoolgirl of the earlier days. She seduced his attention. Sometimes he could not restrain a murmur of assent. Now and then he advanced an objection quite seriously. Gradually they began to argue. The curtain half hid them from the people in the sala. End of Part Second, The Isabels, Chapter Five, Part One. Two, Chapter Five, Section Two of Nostromo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit. LibriVox.org. Recording by Daryl Neely. Nostromo by Joseph Conrad. Part 2, Chapter 5, Section 2. Outside it had grown dark. From the deep trench of shadow between the houses, lit up vaguely by the glimmer of street lamps, ascended the evening silence of Sulaco the silence of a town with few carriages, of unshod horses, and a softly sandaled population. The windows of the Casa Gul flung their shining parallelograms upon the house of the Avellanos. Now and then a shuffle of feet passed below, with the pulsating red glow of a cigarette at the foot of the walls, and the night air as if cooled by the snows of Iguerota, refreshed their faces. We Occidentals, said Martin Bécu, using the usual term the provincials of Sulaco applied to themselves, have been always distinct and separated. As long as we hold Kaita, nothing can reach us. In all our troubles, no army has marched over those mountains. A revolution in the central provinces isolates us at once. Look how complete it is now. The news of Barrios' movement will be cabled to the United States, and only in that way will it reach Santa Marta by the cable from the other seaboard. We have the greatest riches, the greatest fertility, the purest blood in our great families, the most laborious population. The Occidental province should stand alone. The early federalism was not bad for us. Then came this union, which Don Enrique Gould resisted. It opened the road to tyranny. And, ever since, the rest of Costa Guana hangs like a millstone round our necks. The Occidental Territory is large enough to make any man's country. Look at the mountains. Nature itself seems to cry to us, separate. She made an energetic gesture of negation. A silence fell. Oh, yes, I know it's contrary to the doctrine laid down in the history of fifty years' misrule. I am only trying to be sensible. 
but my sense seems always to give you cause for offense. Have I startled you very much with this perfectly reasonable aspiration? She shook her head. No, she was not startled, but the idea shocked her early convictions. Her patriotism was larger. She had never considered that possibility. It may yet be the means of saving some of your convictions, he said, prophetically. She did not answer. She seemed tired. They leaned side by side on the rail of the little balcony, very friendly, having exhausted politics, giving themselves up to the silent feeling of their nearness, in one of those profound pauses that fall upon the rhythm of passion. Towards the plaza end of the street, the glowing coals in the braseros of the market women cooking their evening meal gleamed red along the edge of the pavement. A man appeared without a sound in the light of a street lamp, showing the colored inverted triangle of his bordered poncho, square on his shoulders, hanging to a point below his knees. From the harbor end of the Calleja, a horseman walked his soft-stepping mount, gleaming silver-gray abreast each lamp under the dark shape of the rider. Behold the illustrious Capitals de Cargadores, said Decoud gently, coming in all his splendor after his work is done. The next great man of Sulaco after Don Carlos Gould. But he is good-natured, and let me make friends with him. Ah, indeed, said Antonio. How did you make friends? A journalist ought to have his finger on the popular pulse, and this man is one of the leaders of the populace. A journalist ought to know remarkable men, and this man is remarkable in his way. Ah, yes, said Antonio thoughtfully. It is known that this Italian has a great influence. The horsemen had passed below them with a gleam of dim light on the shining broad quarters of the gray mare, on a bright heavy stirrup, on a long silver spur. But the short flick of yellowish flame in the dusk was powerless against the muffled up mysteriousness of the dark figure with an invisible face concealed by a great sombrero. Decoud and Antonia remained leaning over the balcony, side by side, touching elbows, with their heads overhanging the darkness of the street, and the brilliantly lighted sala at their backs. This was a tete-a-tete -tete of extreme impropriety, something in which, in the whole extent of the Republic, only the extraordinary Antonia could be capable. Poor motherless girl, never accompanied, with a careless father who had thought only of making her learned. Even Decoud himself seemed to feel that this was as much as he could expect of having her to himself till, till the revolution was over and he could carry her off to Europe, away from the endlessness of civil strife whose folly seemed even harder to bear than its ignominy. After one Montero, there would be another. The lawlessness of a populace of all colors and races, barbarism, irremediable tyranny. As the great liberator Bolivar had said in the bitterness of his spirit, America is ungovernable. Those who worked for her independence have plowed the sea. He did not care, he declared boldly. He seized every opportunity to tell her that though she had managed to make a Blanco journalist of him, he was no patriot. First of all, the word had no sense for cultured minds, to whom the narrowness of every belief is odious. And secondly, in connection with the everlasting troubles of this unhappy country, 
it was hopelessly besmirched. It had been the cry of dark barbarism, the cloak of lawlessness, of crimes, of rapacity, of simple thieving. He was surprised at the warmth of his own utterance. He had no need to drop his voice. It had been low all the time, a mere murmur in the silence of dark houses with their shutters closed early against the night air, as in the custom of Sulaco. Only the sala of Casa Gould flung out defiantly the blaze of its four windows, the bright appeal of light in the whole dumb obscurity of the street. And the murmur on the little balcony went on after a short pause. But we are laboring to change all that, Antonia protested. It is exactly what we desire. It is our object. It is the great cause. And the word you despise has stood also for sacrifice, for courage, for constancy, for suffering. Papa, who, plowing the sea, interrupted Deku, looking down. There was below the sound of hasty and ponderous footsteps. Your uncle, the grand vicar of the cathedral, has just turned under the gate, observed Ecoud. He said mass for the troops in the plaza this morning. They had built for him an altar of drums, you know and they brought outside all the painted blocks to take the air. All the wooden saints stood militarily in a row at the top of the great flight of steps. They looked like a gorgeous escort attending the vicar general. I saw the great function from the windows of the poor veneer. He is amazing, your uncle, the last of the Corbeillans. He glittered exceedingly in his vestments with a great crimson velvet cross down his back. And all the time, our savior, Barrios, sat in the Amaria Club, drinking punch at an open window. Esprit fort, our Barrios. I expect at every moment your uncle to launch excommunication there, and then at the black eye patch in the window across the plaza. But not at all. Ultimately, the troops marched off. Later, Barrios came down with some of the officers and stood with his uniform all unbuttoned, discoursing at the edge of the pavement. Suddenly, your uncle appeared, no longer glittering, but all black, at the cathedral door with that threatening aspect he has. You know, like a sort of avenging spirit. He gives one look, strides over straight at the group of uniforms, and leads away the general by the elbow. He walked them for a quarter of an hour in the shade of a wall, never let go his elbow for a moment, talking all the time with exaltation and gesticulating with a long black arm. It was a curious scene. The officers seemed struck with astonishment. Remarkable man, your missionary uncle. He hates an infidel much less than a heretic, and prefers a heathen many times to an infidel. He condescends graciously to call me a heathen, sometimes, you know. Antonia listened with her hands over the balustrade, opening and shutting the fan gently and Decoud talked a little nervously, as if afraid that she would leave him at the first pause. Their comparative isolation and precious sense of intimacy, the slight contact of their arms, affected him softly, for now and then a tender inflection crept into the flow of his ironic murmurs. Any slight sign of favor from a relative of yours is welcome, Antonia. And perhaps he understands me after all. But I know him too, our Padre Corbeillon. The idea of political honor, justice, and honesty for him 
consists in the restitution of the confiscated church property. Nothing else could have drawn that fierce converter of savage Indians out of the wilds to work for the Ruggierist cause. Nothing else but that wild hope. He would make a pronunciamiento himself for such an object against any government if he could only get followers. What does Don Carlos go into that? But, of course, with his English impenetrability, nobody can tell what he thinks. Probably he thinks of nothing apart from his mind, of his imperium in imperio. As to Mrs. Gold, she thinks of her schools, of her hospitals, of the mothers with the young babies, of every sick old man in the three villages. If you were to turn your head now, you would see her extracting a report from that sinister doctor in a check shirt. What's his name? Onigyam. Or else catechizing Don Pepe, or perhaps listening to Padre Roman. They are all down here today, all her ministers of state. Well, she is a sensible woman, and perhaps Don Carlos is a sensible man. It's a part of solid English sense not to think too much, to see only what may be of practical use at the moment. These people are not like ourselves. We have no political reason. We have political passions, sometimes. What is a conviction? A particular view of our personal advantage, either practical or emotional. No one is a patriot for nothing. The word serves us well. But I am clear-sighted, and I shall not use that word to you, Antonio. I have no patriotic illusions. I have only the supreme illusion of a lover. He paused, then muttered almost inaudibly, That can lead one very far, though. Behind their backs, the political tide that once in every twenty-four hours set with a strong flood through the ghoul drawing room could be heard, rising higher in a hum of voices. Men had been dropping in singly, or in twos and threes. The higher officials of the province, engineers of the railway, sunburnt and in tweeds, with the frosted head of their chief smiling with slow humorous indulgence amongst the young eager faces. Scarfe, a lover of Fandangos, had already slipped out in search of some dance, no matter where, on the outskirts of the town. Yon Yuste Lopez, after taking his daughters home, had entered solemnly, in a black creased coat buttoned up under his spreading brown beard. The few members of the provincial assembly present clustered at once around their president to discuss the news of the war and the last proclamation of the rebel Montero, the miserable Montero, calling in the name of a justly incensed democracy upon all the provincial assemblies of the republic to suspend their sittings till his sword had made peace and the will of the people could be consulted. It was practically an invitation to dissolve an unheard of audacity of that evil madman. The indignation ran high in the knot of deputies behind Jose Avellanos. Don Jose, lifting up his voice, cried out to them over the high back of his chair, Sulaco has answered by sending today an army upon his flank. If all the other provinces show only half as much patriotism as we Occidentals. A great outburst of acclamations covered the vibrating treble of the light and soul of the party. Yes, yes, this was true, a great truth. Sulaco was in the forefront, as ever. It was a boastful tumult the hopefulness inspired by the event of the day breaking out amongst these caballeros of the campo, thinking of their herds, of their lands, of the safety of their families. Everything 
was at stake. No, it was impossible that Montero should succeed. This criminal, the shameless Indio. The clamor continued for some time. Everybody else in the room looked towards the group where Don Guste had put on his air of impartial solemnity as if presiding at a sitting of the provincial assembly. Decoud had turned round at the noise and leaning his back on the balustrade, shouted into the room with all the strength of his lungs, Grand Bastia! His unexpected cry had the effect of stilling the noise. All the eyes were directed to the window with an approving expectation. But Decoud had already turned his back upon the room and was again leaning out over the quiet street. This is the quintessence of my journalism. That is the supreme argument, he said to Antonio. I have invented this definition, this last word on a great question. But I am no patriot. I am no more of a patriot than the capitas of the Sulaco Cargadores. This Genoese who had done such great things for this harbor, this active usher in of the material implements for our progress. You have heard Captain Mitchell confess over and over again that till he got this man, he could never tell how long it would take to unload a ship. That is bad for progress. You have seen him pass by after his labors on his famous horse to dazzle the girls in some ballroom with an earthen floor. He is a fortunate fellow. His work is an exercise of personal powers. His leisure is spent in receiving the marks of extraordinary adulation. And he likes it, too. Can anybody be more fortunate? To be feared and admired is, and are these your highest aspirations, Don Marti? interrupted Antonio. I was speaking of a man of that sort, said Decoud curtly. The heroes of the world have been feared and admired. What more could he want? Decoud had often felt his familiar habit of ironic thought fall shattered against Antonia's gravity. She irritated him as if she too had suffered from that inexplicable feminine obtuseness which stands so often between a man and a woman of the more ordinary sort. But he overcame his vexation at once. He was very far from thinking Antonia ordinary, whatever verdict his skepticism might have pronounced upon himself. With a touch of penetrating tenderness in his voice, he assured her that his only aspiration was to a felicity so high that it seemed almost unrealizable on this earth. She colored invisibly with a warmth against which the breeze from the Sierra seemed to have lost its cooling power in the sudden melting of the snows. His whisper could not have carried so far, though there was enough ardor in his tone to melt a heart of ice. Antonia turned away abruptly, as if to carry his whispered assurance into the room behind, full of light, noisy with voices. The tide of political speculation was beating high within the four walls of the great Sala, as if driven beyond the marks by a great gust of hope. Don Yuste's fan-shaped beard was still the center of loud and animated discussions. There was a self-confident ring in all the voices. Even the few Europeans around Charles Gould, a Dane, a couple of Frenchmen, a discreet fat German, smiling with downcast eyes, the representatives of those material interests that had got a footing in Sulaco under the protecting might of the San Tome mine, had infused a lot of good humor into their deference. Charles Gould, to whom they were paying their court, was the visible sign of the stability that could be achieved on the shifting ground of revolutions. They felt hopeful about their various undertakings. 
One of the two Frenchmen, small, black, with glittering eyes lost in an immense growth of bushy beard, waved his tiny brown hands and delicate wrists. He had been traveling in the interior of the province for a syndicate of European capitalists. His forcible Monsieur l'administrateur, returning every minute, shrilled against the steady hum of conversations. He was relating his discoveries. He was ecstatic. Charles Gould glanced down at him courteously. At a given moment of these necessary receptions, it was Mrs. Gould's habit to withdraw quietly into a little drawing room, especially her own, next to the great sala. She had risen and, waiting for Antonia, listened with a slightly worried graciousness to the engineer-in-chief of the railway, who stooped over her, relating slowly, without the slightest gesture, something apparently amusing, for his eyes had a humorous twinkle. Antonia, before she advanced into the room to join Mrs. Gould, turned her head over her shoulder towards Decoud, only for a moment. Why should any one of us think his aspirations unrealizable? she said rapidly. I am going to cling to mine to the end, Antonia, he answered through clenched teeth, then bowed very low, a little distantly. The engineer-in-chief had not finished telling his amusing story. The humors of railway building in South America appealed to his keen appreciation of the absurd, and he told his instances of ignorant prejudice and as ignorant cunning very well. Now Mrs. Gould gave him all her attention as he walked by her side escorting the ladies out of the room. Finally, all three passed unnoticed through the glass doors in the gallery. Only a tall priest, stalking silently in the noise of the sala, checked himself to look after them. Father Corbeillon, whom Decoud had seen from the balcony turning into the gateway of the Casa Gould, had addressed no one since coming in. The long, skimpy Sutan accentuated the tallness of his stature. He carried his powerful torso thrown forward, and the straight black bar of his joined eyebrows, the pugnacious outline of the bony face, the white spot of a scar on the bluish shaven cheeks, a testimonial to his apostolic zeal from a party of unconverted Indians suggested something unlawful behind his priesthood, the idea of a chaplain of bandits. He separated his bony, knotted hands clasped behind his back to shake his finger at Martin. Decoud had stepped into the room after Antonia, but he did not go far. He had remained just within, against the curtain, with an expression of not quite genuine gravity, like a grown-up person taking part in a game of children. He gazed quietly at the threatening finger. I have watched your reverence converting General Barrios by a special sermon on the plaza, he said, without making the slightest movement. What miserable nonsense! Father Corbeillon's deep voice resounded all over the room, making all the heads turn on the shoulders. The man is a drunkard. Senores, the god of your general is a bottle. His contemptuous, arbitrary voice caused an uneasy suspension of every sound, as if the self-confidence of the gathering had been staggered by a blow. But nobody took up Father Corbeillon's declaration. End of Part 2, Chapter 5, Section 2 Recorded by Daryl Neely, Delphi, Maryland Chapter 5, Section 3 of Nostromo This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Nostromo by Joseph Conrad Part 2, Chapter 5, Section 3 It was known that Father Corbelan had come out of the wilds to advocate the sacred rites of the Church with the same fanatical fearlessness with which he had gone preaching to bloodthirsty savages, devoid of human compassion or worship of any kind. Rumors of legendary proportions told of his successes as a missionary beyond the eye of Christian men. He had baptized whole nations of Indians, living with them like a savage himself. It was related that the padre used to ride with his Indians for days, half-naked, carrying a bullock-hide shield, and, no doubt, a long lance, too, who knows, that he had wandered clothed in skins, seeking for proselytes somewhere near the snow-line of the Cordillera. Of these exploits Padre Corbelan himself was never known to talk, but he made no secret of his opinion that the politicians of Santa Marta had harder hearts and more corrupt minds than the heathen to whom he had carried the word of God. His injudicious zeal for the temporal welfare of the church was damaging the Ribierist cause. It was common knowledge that he had refused to be made titular bishop of the Occidental diocese till justice was done to a despoiled church. The political jefe of Sulaco, the same dignitary whom Captain Mitchell saved from the mob afterwards, hinted with naive cynicism that doubtless their excellencies, the ministers, sent the padre over the mountains to Sulaco in the worst season of the year in the hope that he would be frozen to death by the icy blasts of the high paramos. Every year a few hardy muleteers, men inured to exposure, were known to perish in that way. But what would you have? Their excellencies possibly had not realized what a tough priest he was. Meantime the ignorant were beginning to murmur that the Ribierist reforms meant simply the taking away of the land from the people. Some of it was to be given to foreigners who made the railway, the greater part was to go to the Padres. These were the results of the Grand Vicar's zeal. Even from the short allocution to the troops on the plaza, which only the first ranks could have heard, he had not been able to keep out his fixed idea of an outraged church waiting for reparation from a penitent country. The political jefe had been exasperated, but he could not very well throw the brother-in-law of Don José into the prison of the Cabildo. The chief magistrate, an easy-going and popular official, visited the Casa Gold, walking over after sunset from the Intendencia, unattended, acknowledging with dignified courtesy the salutations of high and low alike. That evening he had walked up straight to Charles Gold and had hissed out to him that he would have liked to deport the Grand Vicar out of Sulaco anywhere to some desert island to the isabels for instance <laughs> the one without water preferably eh don carlos he had added in a tone between jest and earnest this uncontrollable priest who had rejected his offer of the episcopal palace for a residence and preferred to hang his shabby hammock amongst the rubble and spiders of the sequestrated dominican convent had taken into his head to advocate an unconditional pardon for Hernandez the robber. And this was not enough. He seemed to have entered into communication with the most audacious criminal the country had known for years. The Sulaco police knew, of course, what was going on. Padre Corbelan had got hold of that reckless Italian, the Capataz de Cargadores, the only man fit for such an errand and had sent a message through him. Father Corbelan had studied in Rome and could speak Italian. The Capataz was known to visit the old Dominican convent at night. An old woman who served the Grand Vicar had heard the name of Hernandez pronounced, and only last Saturday afternoon the Capataz had been observed galloping out of town. He did not return for two days. 
The police would have laid the Italian by the heels if it had not been for fear of the Cargadores, a turbulent body of men quite apt to raise a tumult. Nowadays it was not so easy to govern Sulaco. Bad characters flocked into it, attracted by the money in the pockets of the railway workmen. The populace was made restless by Father Corbelan's discourses. And the first magistrate explained to Charles Gould that now the province was stripped of troops, any outbreak of lawlessness would find the authorities with their boots off, as it were. Then he went away moodily to sit in an armchair, smoking a long, thin cigar, not very far from Don José, with whom, bending over sideways, he exchanged a few words from time to time. He ignored the entrance of the priest, and whenever Father Corbelan's voice was raised behind him, he shrugged his shoulders impatiently. Father Corbelan had remained quite motionless for a time with that something vengeful in his immobility which seemed to characterize all his attitudes. A lurid glow of strong convictions gave its peculiar aspect to the black figure, but its fierceness became softened as the padre, fixing his eyes upon Decoud, raised his long black arm slowly, impressively. "'And you, you are a perfect heathen,' he said in a subdued, deep voice. He made a step nearer, pointing a forefinger at the young man's breast. Decoud, very calm, felt the wall behind the curtain with the back of his head. Then, with his chin tilted well up, he smiled. "'Very well,' he agreed with the slightly weary nonchalance of a man well used to these passages. "'But is it perhaps that you have not discovered yet what is the god of my worship? It was an easier task with our barrios.' The priest suppressed a gesture of discouragement. "'You believe neither in stick nor stone,' he said. "'No bottle,' added Decoud, without stirring. "'Neither does the other of your reverence's confidants. "'I mean the capataz of the cargadores. "'He does not drink. "'Your reading of my character does honour to your perspicacity. "'But why call me a heathen?' "'True,' retorted the priest. "'You are ten times worse. "'A miracle could not convert you.' "'I certainly do not believe in miracles,' said Decoud quietly. Father Corbelan shrugged his high, broad shoulders doubtfully. "'A sort of Frenchman, godless, a materialist,' he pronounced slowly, as if weighing the terms of a careful analysis. "'Neither the son of his own country, nor of any other,' he continued thoughtfully. Scarcely human, in fact, Decoud commented under his breath, his head at rest against the wall, his eyes gazing up at the ceiling. The victim of this faithless age, Father Corbelan resumed in a deep but subdued voice. But of some use as a journalist. Decoud changed his pose and spoke in a more animated tone. Has your worship neglected to read the last number of the Porvenir? I assure you it is just like the others. On the general policy it continues to call Montero a gran bestia, and stigmatize his brother, the guerrillero, for a combination of lackey and spy. What could be more effective? In local affairs it urges the provincial government to enlist bodily into the national army the band of Hernandez the Robber, who is apparently the protégé of the church, or at least of the grand vicar. Nothing could be more sound. The priest nodded and turned on the heels of his square-toed shoes with big steel buckles. Again, with his hands clasped behind his back, he paced to and fro planting his feet firmly. When he swung about, the skirt of his soutane was inflated slightly by the brusqueness of his movements. The great sala had been emptying itself slowly. When the jefe politico rose to go, most of those still remaining 
stood up suddenly in sign of respect, and Don José Avellanos stopped the rocking of his chair. But the good-natured first official made a deprecatory gesture, waved his hand to Charles Gould, and went out discreetly. In the comparative peace of the room, the screaming, Monsieur l'administrateur, of the frail, hairy Frenchman, seemed to acquire a preternatural shrillness. The explorer of the capitalist syndicate was still enthusiastic. Ten million dollars worth of copper practically in sight, Monsieur l'administrateur, ten millions in sight, and a railway coming, a railway. They will never believe my report. C'est trop beau. He fell a prey to a screaming ecstasy in the midst of sagely nodding heads, before Charles Gould's imperturbable calm. And only the priest continued his pacing, flinging round the skirt of his soutane at each end of his beat. Decoux murmured to him ironically, Those gentlemen talk about their gods. Father Corbelan stopped short, looked at the journalist of Sulaco fixedly for a moment, shrugged his shoulders slightly, and resumed his plodding walk of an obstinate traveller. And now the Europeans were dropping off from the group around Charles Gould, till the administrador of the great silver mine could be seen in his whole lank length, from head to foot, left stranded by the ebbing tide of his guests on the great square of carpet, as it were a multicoloured shoal of flowers and arabesques under his brown boots. Father Corbelan approached the rocking chair of Don José Avellanos. "'Come, brother,' he said, with kindly brusqueness, and a touch of relieved impatience a man may feel at the end of a perfectly useless ceremony. "'A la casa, a la casa. This has been all talk. Let us now go and think and pray for guidance from heaven.' He rolled his black eyes upwards. By the side of the frail diplomatist, the life and soul of the party, he seemed gigantic, with a gleam of fanaticism in the glance. But the voice of the party, or rather its mouthpiece, the son de Coup from Paris, turned journalist for the sake of Antonia's eyes, knew very well that it was not so, that he was only a strenuous priest with one idea feared by the women and execrated by the men of the people. Martin de Coux, the dilettante in life, imagined himself to derive an artistic pleasure from watching the picturesque extreme of wrong-headedness into which an honest, almost sacred, conviction may drive a man. It is like madness. It must be, because it's self-destructive, de Coux had said to himself often. It seemed to him that every conviction, as soon as it became effective, turned into that form of dementia the gods send upon those they wish to destroy. But he enjoyed the bitter flavor of that example with a zest of a connoisseur in the art of his choice. Those two men got on well together, as if each had felt respectively that a masterful conviction, as well as utter scepticism, may lead a man very far from the by-paths of political action. Don José obeyed the touch of the big hairy hand. Decoux followed out the brothers-in-law. And there remained only one visitor in the vast empty sala, bluishly hazy with tobacco smoke, a heavy-eyed, round-cheeked man with a drooping moustache, a hide merchant from Esmeralda, who had come overland to Sulaco riding with a few peons across the coast range. He was very full of his journey, undertaken mostly for the purpose of seeing the Señor Administrador of San Tome in relation to some assistance he required in his hide-exporting business. He hoped to enlarge it greatly now that the country was going to be settled. It was going to be settled, he repeated several times, degrading by a strange, anxious whine the sonority of the Spanish language, which he pattered rapidly, like some sort of cringing jargon. A plain man could carry on his little business now in the country, and even think of enlarging it with safety, 
Was it not so? He seemed to beg Charles Gould for a confirmatory word, a grunt of assent, a simple nod even. He could get nothing. His alarm increased, and in the pauses he would dart his eyes here and there. Then, loath to give up, he would branch off into feeling allusion to the dangers of his journey. The audacious Hernandez, leaving his usual haunts, had crossed the Campo of Sulaco, and was known to be lurking in the ravines of the coast range. Yesterday, when distant only a few hours from Sulaco, the hide merchant and his servants had seen three men on the road arrested suspiciously, with their horses' heads together. Two of these rode off at once, and disappeared in a shallow quebrada to the left. "'We stopped,' continued the man from Esmeralda, "'and I tried to hide behind a small bush. But none of my mozos would go forward to find out what it meant, and the third horseman seemed to be waiting for us to come up. It was no use. We had been seen. So we rode slowly on, trembling. He let us pass, a man on a grey horse, with his hat down on his eyes, without a word of greeting. But by and by we heard him galloping after us. We faced about, but that did not seem to intimidate him. He rode up at speed, and, touching my foot with the toe of his boot, asked me for a cigar, with a blood-curdling laugh. He did not seem armed, but when he put his hand back to reach for the matches, I saw an enormous revolver strapped to his waist. I shuddered. He had very fierce whiskers, Don Carlos, and as he did not offer to go on, we dared not move. At last, blowing the smoke of my cigar into the air through his nostrils, he said, "'Senor, it would be perhaps better for you if I rode behind your party. You are not very far from Sulaco now. Go you with God.' "'What would you do?' we went on. There was no resisting him. He might have been Hernandez himself, though my servant, who has been many times to Sulaco by sea, assured me that he had recognized him very well for the capataz of the steamship company's cargadores. Later, that same evening, I saw that very man at the corner of the plaza, talking to a girl, a morenita, who stood by the stirrup with her hand on the grey horse's mane. "'I assure you, Signor Hirsch,' murmured Charles Gould, that you ran no risk on this occasion. That may be, senor, though I tremble yet. A most fierce man to look at. And what does it mean? A person employed by the steamship company talking with salteadores, no less, senor. The other horsemen were salteadores, in a lonely place, and behaving like a robber himself. A cigar is nothing, but what was there to prevent him asking for my purse? No, no, Senor Hirsch, Charles Gould murmured, letting his glance stray away a little vacantly from the round face, with its hooked beak upturned towards him in an almost childlike appeal. If it was the Capitas de Cargadores you met, and there is no doubt, is there, you were perfectly safe. Thank you, you are very good. A very fierce-looking man, Don Carlos. He asked me for a cigar in the most familiar manner. What would have happened if I had not had a cigar? I shudder yet. What business had he to be talking with rubbers in a lonely place? But Charles Gould, openly preoccupied now, gave not a sign, made no sound. The impenetrability of the embodied gold concession had its surface shades. To be dumb is merely a fatal affliction. But the king of Sulaco had words enough to give him all the mysterious weight of a taciturn force. His silences, backed by the power of speech, had as many shades of significance as uttered words in the way of assent, of doubt, of negation, even of simple comment. Some seemed to say plainly, think it over. Others meant clearly, go ahead. A simple, low, I see, with an affirmative nod at the end of a patient listening half-hour, was the equivalent of a verbal contract. 
which men had learned to trust implicitly, since behind it all there was the great San Tome mine, the head and front of the material interests, so strong that it depended on no man's goodwill in the whole length and breadth of the Occidental province, that is, on no goodwill which it could not buy ten times over. But to the little hook-nosed man from Esmeralda, anxious about the export of hides, the silence of Charles Gould portended a failure. Evidently this was no time for extending a modest man's business. He enveloped in a swift mental malediction the whole country with all its inhabitants, partisans of Ribiera and Montero alike, and there were incipient tears in his mute anger at the thought of the innumerable ox-hides going to waste upon the dreamy expanse of the campo, with its single palms rising like ships at sea within the perfect circle of the horizon, its clumps of heavy timber motionless like solid islands of leaves above the running waves of grass. There were hides there, rotting, with no profit to anybody, rotting where they had been dropped by men called away to attend the urgent necessities of political revolutions. The practical, mercantile soul of Senor Hirsch rebelled against all that foolishness, while he was taking a respectful but disconcerted leave of the might and majesty of the San Tome mine in the person of Charles Gould. He could not restrain a heartbroken murmur, wrung out of his very aching heart, as it were. It is a great, great foolishness, Don Carlos, all this. The price of hides in Hamburg is gone up, up. Of course the Ribierist government will do away with all that, when it gets established firmly. Meantime, he sighed. Yes, meantime, repeated Charles Gould inscrutably. The other shrugged his shoulders. But he was not ready to go yet. There was a little matter he would like to mention very much, if permitted. It appeared he had some good friends in Hamburg, he murmured the name of the firm, who were very anxious to do business in dynamite, he explained, a contract for dynamite with the San Tome mine, and then, perhaps, later on, other mines, which were sure to the little man from esmeralda was ready to enlarge but charles interrupted him it seemed as though the patience of the senor administrador was giving way at last senor hirsch he said i have enough dynamite stored up at the mountain to send it down crashing into the valley his voice rose a little to send half sulaco into the air if i liked Charles Gould smiled at the round, startled eyes of the dealer in hides, who was murmuring hastily, Just so, just so. And now he was going. It was impossible to do business in explosives with an administrador so well provided and so discouraging. He had suffered agonies in the saddle and had exposed himself to the atrocities of the bandit Hernandez for nothing at all neither hides nor dynamite, and the very shoulders of the enterprising Israelite expressed dejection. At the door he bowed low to the engineer-in-chief. But at the bottom of the stairs in the patio he stopped short, with his podgy hand over his lips in an attitude of meditative astonishment. "'What does he want to keep so much dynamite for?' he muttered. And why does he talk like this to me? The engineer-in-chief, looking in at the door of the empty sala, whence the political tide had ebbed out to the last insignificant drop, nodded familiarly to the master of the house, standing motionless like a tall beacon amongst the deserted shoals of furniture. Good night, I am going. Got my bike downstairs. The railway will know where to go for dynamite, should we get short at any time. We have done cutting and chopping for a while now. We shall begin soon to blast our way through. Don't come to me, said Charles Gould, with perfect serenity. I shan't have an ounce to spare for anybody. Not an ounce. Not for my own brother, if I had a brother. 
and he were the engineer-in-chief of the most promising railway in the world. "'What's that?' asked the engineer-in-chief, with equanimity. "'Unkindness?' "'No,' said Charles Gould, stolidly. "'Policy.' "'Radical, I should think,' the engineer-in-chief observed from the doorway. "'Is that the right name?' Charles Gould said from the middle of the room. "'I mean, going to the roots, you know.' the engineer explained with an air of enjoyment. "'Why, yes,' Charles pronounced slowly. "'The gold concession has struck such deep roots in this country, in this province, in that gorge of the mountains, that nothing but dynamite shall be allowed to dislodge it from there. It's my choice. It's my last card to play.' The engineer-in-chief whistled low. A pretty game, he said, with a shade of discretion. And uh, have you told Holroyd of that extraordinary trump card you hold in your hand? Card only when it's played, when it falls at the end of the game. Till then you might call it a... a... Weapon, suggested the railway man. No, you may call it rather an argument, corrected Charles Gould gently. And that's how I've presented it to Mr. Holroyd. And what did he say to it? asked the engineer with undisguised interest. He, Charles Gould spoke after a slight pause. He said something about holding on like grim death and putting our trust in God. I should imagine he must have been rather startled. But then, pursued the administrador of the San Tome mine, but then he is very far away, you know. And, as they say in this country, God is very high above. The engineer's appreciative laugh died away on the stairs, where the Madonna with the child on her arm seemed to look after his shaking broad back from her shallow niche. End of chapter 5